After that, everybody's going to be late. So, good morning. And uh, we're finishing our talk about center of mass. Again, remember this device, flying plunger. The center of mass is closer to the heavy part of it. And uh, uh, I broke it yesterday. Now I cannot turn it off. It's always on now. <clears throat> but so what is the center of mass? Again, it's an abstract point which behaves in a way the whole system would have behaved if we would compress it in one single dot, yeah, point-like object. So when a system has a size and flies, moves in space, the center of mass travels like it would have been just a, a ball, just, just a small object like this, or like this. Better. And uh, of course, because even if it's an, an imaginary object which has some mass, we still can apply the Newton's law for that. This equation, standard uh, application of a Newton's second law for an object which has the mass equal to the mass of the whole system, should tell us how the center of mass uh, travels. We can calculate the acceleration if we want to, and if we use some extra reasoning velocity, position, but uh, <coughs> we don't need to do that. This is what we uh, want to talk about. If the net force acting on the whole system is zero, acceleration has to be zero, which means the center of mass should travel at constant velocity. The center of mass of the system should travel at constant velocity, even if the parts of a system move relative to each other, like two cards. The center of mass should travel at constant velocity. Mass times uh, velocity is momentum. So this is kind of another derivation of the law of conservation of linear momentum of a system when the net force acting on the system is equal to zero. And there's a special case, interesting, case when the center of mass was at rest, meaning the system was initially at rest, but then something inside the system starts happening. But if the net force acting on the system is zero, no matter what's happening inside, the center of mass should remain at the same location. And uh, uh, you may have experienced something like that if you walk on the boat, you walk in one direction, the boat starts moving in opposite direction. So I don't have a boat, I have my cart, the object number three. Well, right now the motion of this cart is no different from the motion of this cart relative to Earth. Because if I consider a system composed of cart and this track, the net force is not zero. I'm holding it. My hand touches it. But if I remove my hand, normal force and force of gravity cancel each other out. We can neglect friction. What's going to happen? The cart travels to the right. But in order to compensate that motion, the track should travel in opposite direction. This is, again, a uh, law of conservation of linear momentum because initially total momentum was equal to zero. So now, if we have momentum to the right, we have to have momentum to the right, to the left. But also, the center of mass of this system, that's one kilogram, the heaviest part of it. So the center of mass should be closed somewhere here and uh, no matter how they move relative to each other, 
at every instant the center of mass should remain roughly at the same location. Well, something like that. <coughs> now, of course, the question is how do we calculate uh, the location of the center of mass? Well, <coughs> there is a way to do that. We just have to start from the original equation and then dot, 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 dot. That's very simple algebra, but long. So the result is the equation on the screen. <coughs> uh, in general, we may have many objects in a system. If you have two objects, we always can draw a line which connects these objects, use it as the x-axis, and then this equation will tell us the location of the center of mass for these two objects. If we have many objects, in general, a dot, a point which represents the center of mass, may have two or even three coordinates, but uh, we don't talk about three-dimensional situations here, so for us, maximum number of coordinates is two, and for each coordinate, we can apply the same equation. So you can play with the links at home, see what might be happening. Right now, we just need to do some example. <coughs> and uh, so that's the first question to you. In this situation, a system is composed of two objects. One is lighter, another is heavier. We know the distance. And we need to calculate the exact location of the center of mass. So where do you think? We will find it when we finish our calculation. And now we have to finish our calculation by applying the equation we have, we have derived. Yeah. So first, since we are calculating a specific location relative to x-axis, we have to see that axis. It's not there, so we have to add it. But adding just a line which points to the right is not enough. We also have to choose the origin, the zero. Where can we choose the origin? Anywhere. So normally we would choose it at the most left location. So all other numbers will be automatically positive. So at the location of this ball, we can choose the origin. We set zero here. So if we call objects number one and number two, x1 automatically becomes equal to zero because we did that. We set it to zero. But x2 automatically becomes equal to 80 centimeters. That's it. Now we just have to write an equation. The x coordinate of a center of mass should be equal to this kind of looks like the average mass distribution, which technically it is. X1, M1 plus X2, M2 divided by the total mass. Now we just have to plug numbers in. So 0 times uh, 250 plus uh, 80 times 600 divided by 250 plus 600. As you can see, I didn't even convert any units. First of all, I don't, really, I don't really need to convert grams into kilograms because units of mass getting canceled. We have mass in the numerator. We have mass in the denominator. Grams over grams, kilograms over kilograms, tons over tons getting canceled. And uh, whatever unit we use for L or X, that automatically gives the unit for the center of mass coordinate, which will be centimeters. Well, now we need to cal <coughs> calculate this number. Uh, 
Well, it's Friday. I don't want to work, so someone please tell me the answer. For me, it's almost Saturday already. Hmm? 56.5 centimeters. So, <clears throat> is it in the middle? No. The middle point is right here at 40 centimeters away from the left ball. And 56 is somewhere here. So this is the location of the center of mass. And as we knew before, it's supposed to be closer to the heavier part of the system. That's it. Questions? All right, so we are done with the collisions, center of mass. I just want to show one more toy. The manufacturer calls this swinging wonder. In physics, we call it Newton's cradle because he invented it. And this uh, device demonstrates how a combination of law of conservation of energy and law of conservation of linear momentum works. You can deflect one or two balls. Well, actual Newton, Newton's cradle has uh, nine balls. And you can see that if you deflect one ball, one ball will be hit on another side and again and again and again. Well, of course, uh, friction eventually takes energy out, eventually. But if you use steel balls and it's adjusted, it might last for a relatively long time, you know, this process. So it, you look at it and you think about life. I don't know what else. Mathematically, uh, if we wanted to, we don't have to, but if we wanted to, mathematically, we, we could solve and prove that for one ball on the left, it should be one ball on the right, two balls on the left, it should be two balls on the right, because it's basically neglecting friction. That uh, means mechanical energy has to be conserved, and of course, the initial height on the left and final height on the right should be equal to each other, neglecting friction. And when they collide, that's actually practically, absolutely elastic collision. Again, if there is no energy loss. So we could repeat all the reasoning we used yesterday. <coughs> well, what is circular motion? Circular motion is a motion when a trajectory is a circle. Like this. What is a circle? You know it's a circle, but how do you prove it? What is a circle? Yes. Yes, the official definition, set of, a set of locations or points equally displaced from the same point in the same plane, because if it's not the same plane, it, that would have been a sphere. Yeah, so that's a, we, don't, we don't talk about three-dimensional motion. We only talk about two-dimensional. That's a circle. And uh, as any object, this ball has velocity and uh, distance traveled. So we can describe the motion of this ball using all previous quantities. And for a circular motion, we only have two important situations to discuss. Number one when the speed of the object remains constant. This situation has a special name, a uniform circular motion. And number two, when the speed changes, in that case, that's something different and we're not going to talk about it. So for the uniform circular motion, speed remains constant. What about velocity? 
the velocity of this ball. Is it constant? Does it change? Change or constant? You have to say something. What uh, specifically changes? The direction. We know from the past, we discussed it, that instantaneous velocity always tangent to trajectory. So right here, right now, instantaneous velocity points like this. If at this very moment, this guy would release uh, the string, the ball would fly in the direction of a velocity. And <clears throat> at the new location, velocity remains tangent to trajectory. So the new velocity has a different direction. But the magnitude, that's what we call speed, is the same. That's what a uniform circular motion is. Uh, so I'm going to ask you two questions simultaneously. That's going to be the first question. When speed is constant and not zero, and this you have to choose. Second question. When velocity is constant and not zero, and the same set of possible answers. So for your convenience, both questions on the screen simultaneously. So you have to enter your answers for two questions at, you know, Question number three about speed. Question number four about velocity. <clears throat> you can discuss. I'm for rhomboidal. What rhomboidal? Well, it's like a rhombus. No, that can't be true. Most probably it's uh, none of the above. No, maybe it's all of the above. There is an answer which doesn't make any sense, so don't choose that one. So by now you already know what you want to say. And I want to see how many people said they've been late. So at 8.30 we had 60 persons. Now we have 75, so 15 students were late. Six admitted that. Nine lied. So these are questions three and four. We already start having some distribution. For number three, we have kind of 50-50 between answer three and four. And for number four, we have winning answer four. All right. <clears throat> what is the difference between speed and velocity? Yes. Yes. And how do they connect it? Speed is just magnitude of velocity. Velocity is a vector. Yes, it has a direction and magnitude. And that magnitude also has a different name, speed. And uh, when velocity remains constant, that means acceleration equals zero. Net force equals zero. The object travels constant velocity straight ahead. That's just Newton's first law. Nothing else, nothing new. When, when speed remains constant, anything can happen. It's basically about maintaining the speed. Yeah. An experienced driver can drive maintaining the same speed and uh, choosing different path. So. Uh, it doesn't have to be circular, actually. It could be anything in general. 
Next question. So, <clears throat> I'm just going to show what's happening here. I've got a small object attached to a string, and I make it move in a circle like this. Nothing else. Could have been a ball, doesn't matter. Don't say red. You can see it's not red. There are different approaches, of course, to answer this question. One of these is on the screen, a hint. What does make it move in a circle? Why it doesn't fly away? The string holds it, the string. So there has to be a special force. How do we call this the force? Tension. The force of tension is acting. Not the only force acting on it, right? Because it's on a tabletop, there's force of gravity, normal force. We just don't see those forces in this picture. <coughs> but uh, <coughs> this is a very typical situation when we talk about rotation, uh, circular motion. Sometimes it's convenient to look at the system from different perspectives. This is a top view. That's what we see from above. What would we see if we look at it horizontally? We, we wouldn't see the circle. We could see just, well, the tabletop, this object, and the string, something like that. And uh, in this situation, from this perspective, easier to see forces acting on it, normal force, force of gravity, and that force of tension. Now, the question basically is net force equal to zero. Yes or no? Net force acting on this subject, is it zero? What do you think? Yes, yes, you say something. No, it's not, because we can add vectors. Gravity and normal cancel each other, but nothing, well, theoretically, also could have been friction. Still not canceling force of tension, so. The answer is no. If net force is not zero, acceleration is not zero. They just <coughs> related by the Newton's second law. So this is a specific example, but the answer works for all types of circular motion. Oh. Doesn't really matter what is moving in a circle and how. The acceleration of, an, on, of an object making circular motion just cannot be equal to zero. There has to be some force which keeps it spinning around. Never zero. So speed remains constant, but velocity direction changes. That's why acceleration is not zero. Now. We know in the past, from the past, that acceleration should be related to something else, time, velocity, some features of a trajectory. So how do we calculate acceleration? Well, we can start from average acceleration, velocity final minus velocity initial divided by time. So at this instant, velocity points like this. In a half of a second or something, velocity points like that. So literally, we have to subtract two arrows. One arrow points like this, minus second arrow points like this. Well, divided by time, how do we subtract vectors? We convert subtraction into addition. So that's going to be like this, plus like that. How do we add vectors? Tail to a head rule. So some, something like this, plus like this. And now we have to draw the resultant, something like this, divided by time. 
So in the end, that should be a vector which points something like that. Maybe longer, maybe may, may shorter. But <coughs> if we, well, first of all, that's not the instantaneous acceleration yet. That's the average. To get the instantaneous, we, we would have to draw those vectors closer and closer to each other. And if we do that and look at what's happening, turns out the final direction, of course, should point to the center because that's how net force points. Nothing new. So acceleration should point like this. But more importantly, if we, if, if we do a simple geometry, this is a triangle I used for velocities. But I can also see that the triangle made by the cord, radius number one, radius number two, is like triangle with this. They have the same angles. So we can do geometry. This side over that should be equal to this side over that. Distance over time is a speed. So we can do some algebra. You can do it at home. Nice exercise. That's the result of that algebra. The magnitude of this acceleration is equal to speed squared divided by the radius of the circle. And of course, it points toward the center of the circle. This acceleration has a special name. We call it centripetal acceleration. And for any motion with const any circular motion with constant speed, we can always calculate this, uh, this acceleration using this equation, always. So now, <clears throat> for any object making circular motion, we can always apply the Newton's second law because forces act. We can always apply an expression for centripetal acceleration and done. We have learned everything about circular, uniform circular motion. We just have to apply this type of strategy again and again and again to different specific situations. Like this one. Ah, yeah, a note about the language. When people say centripetal force, there is no such force as an actual force. An actual force responsible for the existence of centripetal acceleration is a tension or a normal force, magnetic force, electric force, anything which actually acts on the object. Force of gravity keeps satellites. So this name is just a term, centripetal force just represents the product of the mass of this object and the acceleration of that object. That's it, nothing else. Not an actual force. So we start from vertical circular motion because it's more complicated than horizontal physically. Because in general, um, for the ball on a string, for example, it's impossible to maintain constant speed. If you have a roller coaster, you can maintain the engine. Yeah. A stuntman on a motorcycle can travel in a loop, maintaining the same speed. But he uses friction for that. There is no friction here. So this ball <coughs> doesn't travel in a uniform circular motion. Slows down, speeds up, slows down, speeds up. However, for a vertical circular motion, we have two specific situations, the lowest one and the highest one, which are very, very treatable. So let's take a quick look at both. What's happening at the bottom? Well, first, of course, we have to draw a free body diagram. Always keep in mind, just like a ball on a string, so there has to be a string which hold, holds this ball. How does tension point? Up along the string. Bless you. How does gravity point? Down, because it always points down. 
how does acceleration point? Well, uh, there is no other way but just toward the center up because that's how net force points. The Newton's second law says F net equals M A. So the acceleration has to point up. And uh, now we can write the law relative to positive y direction. We should write that F tension minus force of gravity. Uh, and I use magnitudes of equals M times A. But now at this very instant, when acceleration points straight toward the center, it is centripetal acceleration. So we can also write a second expression And now, uh, that's it. We can, uh, for example, solve it for the force of tension. It will be equal to mg plus mv squared over r. So at the bottom, the force of tension is greater than just regular weight of an object. It doesn't have to be a string. Could have been a loop. In that case, the physical nature of this force would have been normal force. And normal force produces apparent weight. So in a way, this is similar to being an elevator which accelerates upward. The apparent weight increases. Now, please draw a body diagram for the second point, the highest point. The ball or wherever object is uh, moving is at the highest point of the trajectory. So you have to draw three arrows again, gravity, tension, and acceleration. Well, how does gravity point? Always points down. How does tension point? Along the string, which means now, down. How does acceleration point? Newton's law says it has to point like net force points, and in this situation, also down. But in this situation, it also means toward the center of the circle, not to the left, to the right, which means this acceleration also, for that particular instant, is equal to centripetal acceleration. Done. So if you write now the Newton's second law, well, technically, we have to write three minuses. Yeah. Minus, minus, minus. And when I write those minuses, I assume each variable represents the magnitude of that vector. But of course, if we multiply by negative one, <coughs> the whole equation, it becomes easier and acceleration can be replaced by its magnitude v squared over r. And we can solve again for force of tension, for example. Or if it's a roller coaster, with the normal force acting down from the track on, well, the, the train, the wagon, the person. We can see again the apparent weight will be different. Well, <coughs> uh, same calculation, same pictures. And uh, that's an important statement. The physical nature of that force doesn't matter. We used specific case of tension, but could have been anything. So. <coughs> Let's use this theory for a specific experiment. You know that a 
everything, every single thing has its breaking point. If you pull on this string strong enough, it breaks. So, <clears throat> actually, I need to know when. So, we're pulling, nothing, 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 six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten. All right. Everything can, can, can be broken. Strings, economies. So this is a half of a kilogram. I can attach it and make a pendulum. And when pendulum swings, it doesn't make complete circle, but this arc is a part of a circle, so it actually makes a circular motion. Here at the bottom, as we know, the apparent weight is greater than the actual weight. Well, nothing bad happening. So far, so good. What happened? Well, <coughs> when we increase the height, we store more energy in it. So when it swings back, it travels faster and faster at the bottom. And the speed, as we saw, is supposed to affect the tension in the string. And when it reaches the critical value, it breaks. That's it. So <coughs> this is a very common situation when we have to calculate some critical value. So we start from a certain height, which we need to calculate. And at the bottom, it breaks. The string breaks. So <coughs> well, that's supposed to be circle, kind of. OK. <coughs> so what do we know? We know the mass, a half of a kilogram. Uh, um, we know the length. 80 centimeters. And we know that it breaks when tension reaches 10 newtons. Right. So the maximum strength it sustains equals 10 newtons. That's a, that critical value of the tension. Now, at the bottom, force of gravity points down, tension points up and acceleration points up, and in this particular instant, it points to the center. So as we said, tension should be equal to mg plus mv squared over r. But now uh, we can use it backwards for calculating that speed the weight has at the bottom. So tension equals 10. That's the maximum value. That's the critical speed. Uh, force of gravity equals 0.5 times 10, 5. And that should be equal to 0.5 times speed squared. That critical speed squared divided by the radius of the circle. But the radius is equal to the length of that string, 0.8. Hence, 10 minus 5 times 0.8 over 0.5 equals critical speed squared. Critical speed squared will be equal to 508. That's not what we are looking for yet. We are looking for the height, but <coughs> The process we call swing yeah, happens practically without any friction, which means we can apply the law of conservation of mechanical energy without friction. 
which says the initial mechanical energy has to be equal to final. Now, of course, we set the zero level at the lowest location. In that case, y initial equals the height we are looking for. So kinetic initial equals zero. Okay. So kinetic initial plus potential initial should be equal to kinetic final plus potential final, which tells us zero plus mgh should be equal to mv squared over two plus zero. The good thing about this, well, actually two good things. First, we can cancel the mass. Second, we don't need to know speed. We need to know speed squared, which we already know. So the height we are looking for will be equal to speed squared divided by 2 divided by g. So 8 over 2 times 10. 0.4, about 40 centimeters. That's the maximum height. We can release it from in order. The pendulum would keep swinging back and forth. Any questions? In this problem, we combined different types of knowledge, consideration of energy, and uh, circular motion, and Newton's law. Next, <coughs> the opposite point. We know what's happening at the bottom. Now let's see what's happening at the top. So in this situation, I have a pail. Yes, I do. So I have a ball in it. So if I move it in a circle relatively slowly, the ball falls out. But if I move it fast enough, the ball remains inside. Well, anybody can do it with the ball. Let's do it with water. You're in a splash zone. You have to hide your computer just in case. You never know. If, you never know. Why is it red? Blood? Food coloring. Don't assume the worst. So <clears throat> you just have to spin it fast enough and it remains inside. The trick is to slow it down also fast enough so it wouldn't, wouldn't splash around. But as you know, if I would be slowing it down gradually at a certain point, it should <coughs> fall, it should rain. So there has to be some critical speed between the regime when it's safe inside and regime when it's out. That's what we're looking for. What is that critical speed? But we know what to do. We just have to apply the same type of reasoning to a different location, to a different point, that, to the top point. So right here, we have a well, snapshot of a bucket at the highest point. And uh, <coughs> we have some water, well, red water inside. Well, which object should we draw a diagram? What do you think? We need to show forces acting on something. On what? What are our choices? Water or a bucket? Yes, yeah, that's only choices. So if I ask, what object do you want to use for free body diagram? You should say either water or a bucket. So what object do you want to use for free body diagram? Say something. Hmm? Can't hear you. Now you have to say water or a bucket. 
water. How many forces are acting on water? How many? It's a number from zero to infinity. How many forces are acting on water in that bucket? Two, the bucket touches, so there is normal force from the bucket on water. And gravity, how many forces are acting on the pail, on the bucket? Three, force of gravity. String, it's not attached to water. Yeah, string is attached to the bucket. Plus water pushes, so three forces. What's easier to analyze, two forces or three forces? Well, two. So we have two forces acting on water, gravity, and the normal force from the bucket. And it doesn't have to be water. Could have been a ball, like in original experiment. Could have been a tiny person, an ant, sitting there experiencing that normal force. Doesn't really matter. Physics is the same. And at the highest point, acceleration points straight down toward the center of the circle. So what we write is, again, the Newton's law, which says, that's what it says. I already have multiplied everything by negative 1 in my mind, like I did before. Now, when I move it faster or slower, does it affect gravity? No. What does it affect? Normal force. If I move it slower and slower, eventually the water or the ball should fall out. So eventually it should stop touching it. When it doesn't touch the bucket anymore, normal force becomes equal to what? If water doesn't touch the bucket anymore, normal force equals what number? What number? What number? Zero. That's the critical regime. That's the critical situation. After that, if we start moving it even slower, that's it. It falls out. So when velocity reaches critical value, hence normal force reaches its own critical value, which is zero. So this is our equation. When normal force becomes equal to zero, mg should be equal to ma or G should be equal to A, or G should be equal to V squared over R. So that critical speed should be equal to this. So in my specific example, that radius equals a half of a meter. So square root of 5, 2 point something, 2.2. If I move it faster than that, I'm safe. If I move it slower, that's it. It falls out. Meters per second. Any questions? Well, uh, vertical motion yeah, happens a lot. For example, if you want to build a roller coaster, you have to calculate all, the, all, all, all those uh, critical speeds, critical heights. This is an, another example. Which demonstrates the same phenomenon if I release it from a relatively low height. That's it. It falls off the track. It cannot get through. Fast. If I release it from a certain height, it easily gets through. It has to be critical. Below that, if the ball released below that, it's not getting through. So in order to get through the loop, there has to be uh, the object has to be released above that critical value. So where is that critical value? 
Well, we just have to solve the problem. <clears throat> so if we release this object from rest, <coughs> well, it slides down, travels through, da da da. What does word critical mean? Well, we know that it means it kind of barely touches the track at the top. Which means, again, word critical, H critical, height critical, initial height, initial Y critical, means that at the top, at point C, normal force instantaneously becomes zero. And that problem has been solved one minute ago. So nothing changed. That means at the highest point MG and MA should be equal to each other. That means at the highest point, speed, speed at, the, at point C should be equal to square root of this product. Nothing new. We just have to now make an extra step. We have to relate this speed here. How does it point? Tangent to trajectory. That speed at point, uh, velocity at point C, it points to the right, and that's the magnitude of it. So. <coughs> The initial speed is zero, and now it's not. Why? Well, because the object had some potential energy. So now we have to apply the law of consideration of mechanical energy like we did with the problem for the string. M G Y initial should be equal to M V C squared over two. Nothing new. That, equa that, that equation implies OK, I cannot do it. I want it. This equation implies that I chose the zero level at point C, but I cannot do that because it's already chosen for me. So I have to add potential energy at point C, M, G. <coughs> Y, C. Okay, I, uh, the kinetic initial is zero, potential initial MGY initial, kinetic final equals MV squared over two, and potential final here measured from the bottom equals MGY at point C. So again, we can cancel masses, and uh, this is what we're looking for initial value of the y coordinate, initial height, that should be equal to a very simple expression. Done. We actually can make it simpler because we know that the speed at, at the highest point should be equal to square root of rg. So well, square root squared uh, r over 2 plus 2 times r. The distance from the bottom to the top of the loop, the di just a second, the distance from the bottom to the top equals the diameter, which is double the radius. Yes? I divided everything by G here. So in this term, G remains, and in this term, G getting canceled. 
Any questions? Well, uh, it's solved, and uh, now we're going to talk about horizontal circular motion. There are many examples of a horizontal circular motion. This device has a name, a conic pendulum. It's not an actual pendulum. It doesn't swing, but it rotates, circulates. If you give it a push, just be careful. And it keeps circulating. Without friction, it would be circulating forever. That's it. <coughs> uh, another types of circular motion. Well, first of all, just regular horizontal turn. And then, if you're speed racing, making a turn on a banked track. So, for the horizontal circular motion, we can always assume that it's a uniform circular, mo circular motion. We can always maintain the speed to be constant. Question. This is a photograph, a snapshot of this conic pendulum at this particular instant. Remember, it spins. So if you have a camera, you can make a snapshot. And at this particular instant, the ball is here. And of course, it keeps going. It keeps going. But we take a photograph, and the ball is to the right, to the pole. And at this very instant, the acceleration of the ball must ha have some I broke it. Must have some direction. So the question is, what do you think <coughs> about the direction of the centripetal acceleration at this very instant? Now, again, it's a situation when looking differently on the system helps. This is a side view. That's what we see. But in order to draw acceleration, we need to see the circle, the trajectory, because centripetal acceleration points toward the center of that trajectory. And here we don't see that trajectory. Here all we see is, well, that's it. So we pretend or imagine that we look from above. What would we see? Well, we would see the same ball and kind of same string. That would be the center of the pole. And the ball would be moving like this. Now we can see the circle. And now we can see the center of that circle. And now we can say, OK, at this very instant, the acceleration should point toward the center. Not along the tension, not along the gravity. There is nothing which pulls on this ball physically in a horizontal direction. This is just a line which represents the direction in which acceleration points. But we have only two forces acting on it, an actual tension like this and force of gravity like that. Nothing else. But of, of course, we can always write the Newton's second law. And the Newton's second law says, well, the force of tension plus the force of gravity should be equal to mass times acceleration. And this acceleration should have magnitude equals speed squared over radius of the circle. If we look from above, this is the radius of a circle. If we look at uh, from a side, this is not the radius. This line is not the radius of a circle. This line is just equal to the length of this string. 
this is the radius of the circle, R. And of course, there is a certain angle between the string and the vertical direction. These variables all involved, all related. How? Well, this is how. That's the only way to relate these variables. Well, and we'll do this in a minute. So that's how acceleration points always toward the center. So let's solve a specific problem. Let's say we have uh, an object circulating around the pole. So again, that's the picture. Uh, the pole, <coughs> little ball, <coughs> the string, that the radius of a circle the ball makes, that the angle between the string and the vertical direction. All right, what do we know? Angle. mass, a half of a kilogram. And this ball, this weight makes three revolutions every two seconds. Well, in physics, and we talk, we're going to talk about it later next week, the number of revolutions when we, when we assign a letter for the number of revolutions, usually it's capital N. And of course, time is just lowercase, <coughs> lowercase t. So that's what we know. The free body diagram looks like this, nothing new. And as we said, at this very instant, acceleration points to the left. And now the Newton's the Newton's second law tells if we add these vectors, we should get m times a. Now we have a fork. We can add x and y axes, and we can use component method. Works. Always. But boring. We know how to add vectors. We've done it before. So that's what I prefer doing. We need to add two vectors. And the sum has to be equal to the third vector. When we are adding vectors, we have to apply a tail to a head rule. And uh, hence, this plus this equals this. You want to say something? No? OK, I'll wait. You want to say something? Well, in this triangle, mg and t don't even have directions. So how would I change it? Well, but if you insist, I can add the directions. Tension points toward the, toward the top of this device, and gravity always points down. <coughs> Do you want to say something? Anything, just say anything, please. I hate silence. Also think about what prevents you from saying anything. Yes. No? 
direction of t represented by a string. A string points like this, and I keep it like this, and I keep it like this. The only thing which might confuse me is these two arrows, which, not, which don't represent any forces. They represent a fork in our reasoning. This is tension. This is gravity. This is MA. This is tension. This is gravity. This is MA. I don't see any problems with tension. I don't have any tension about tension. Yes? Because the Newton's law forces me to do that. When two forces act on an object, I have to add them up together. That's what I'm doing. Force number one, force number two. I'm doing uh, the law. Anybody else jump in? Yes. Acceleration. So what's wrong with my picture? You're referring to this arrow, right? So it doesn't look like it's supposed to, right? If it doesn't look like it's supposed to, how do we fix it? How do we fix it? What do we do? What action do I have to make? You say it, I do it. You don't say it, I'm waiting. Hmm? Redraw, yes, that's the action. And every time when you draw something wrong, you have to redraw it. <laughs> no tricks here. And you know, I told you many, many times, thinking is not required. You just have to look at it. OK, I made a mistake. It's wrong. I have to redraw it. Redraw it. Acceleration must be horizontal. So wrong. Fix. That's the fix. This arrow represents tension. This arrow represents force of gravity. This arrow represents the product m times a. It doesn't represent acceleration. It represents the product of mass and acceleration. In this triangle, this angle equals 15 degrees. And in this triangle, this side mg is equal to 5 newtons. That's it. So the triangle. 15 degrees, 5 newtons. This is 0.5 times acceleration. This is force of tension. That's 90 degrees angle. 0 0.5. OK. So done. For example, 5 over tension should be equal to what function of 15 degrees? Cosine which means tension should be equal to 5 over cosine 15, wherever it is. Come on, come on, come on. 5 divided by cosine 15. I got 5.17, 5.2. And now, uh, 
0.5 times acceleration divided by 5 newtons should be equal to tangent of 15 degrees. So acceleration will be equal to 0.5. <coughs> 10 times tangent of 15 degrees. And 10 is actually G. We wouldn't need using numbers because we could do geometry MA over MG should be equal to tangent of theta. So we can cancel masses and G will be equal to t G times tangent theta. Well, 10, 10 times 10, 15, 2.679, meters per second squared. Uh, what else can we calculate? Length, radius. So this number, A, should be equal to V squared over R, right? Um, we know something about speed. Let me check. The ball makes three revolutions every two seconds. So uh, the speed, suppo speed, speed, supposed to be equal to distance traveled over time. And the distance traveled, three revolutions means three circumferences. Three times two pi r, r divided by two seconds. So two over two, three pi times the radius. So the acceleration should be equal to three pi radius squared over radius. So on one hand, that's 2.7, because we just found it. On another hand, that's going to be equal to 9 times pi squared times radius squared over the radius. So 9 pi squared r. So we can calculate the radius, 2.7, relatively small radius, wherever it is. And uh, if we wanted to, we could calculate the length of the string, because We could use the same right triangle. Uh, the radius divided by length should be equal to sine of theta, which means the length should be equal to radius over sine of theta. Well, I have no room left, so I'm done. We have found everything we could. Of course, it's not about what we know and what we're looking for. It's about relationships, equations. And the equations for this situation, the equations for this situation come from the right angle triangle immediately. If we know how to direct acceleration and uh, if we know how to add vectors. Well, alternatively, you can use the component method like we used before. You will get exactly the same result, of course. Well, uh, so again, this physics is behind many, many applications. <coughs> when we make a turn, It only can happen when friction is acting. We kind of used to think friction is bad. No, not always. Nothing is always bad or always good. So the mere fact we can walk is because friction acts on us. When we walk, we push on the Earth. And according to Newton's third law, the Earth pushes back and propels us. And that, when wheels spin. That's exactly the same situation happening. Wheels push on the earth and the earth propels the car ahead. Without friction, we would be just you know, sliding on, 
try to walk on ice, try to walk on ice covered in oil. Impossible. Same uh, driving. <coughs> if you drive and you need to make a turn and you encounter very slippery icy surface, you, no matter how you move your wheels, you're still going to just slide ahead. What does make it turn? Well, if you turn the wheels, they start pushing on the ground, and the ground starts pushing back. And that force is responsible for the turn. That force is responsible for the existence of that acceleration. And <clears throat> Uh, we can just solve a specific problem, which tells us how fast can we drive if we want to make a specific turn. So the road is made in the form of a circle with a given radius. The friction depends on the condition of a you know, surface, yeah. road condition, and if if we drive drive relatively slowly. There is no problem to make a turn, but if we start driving faster and faster and faster, at a certain point we can start skidding away. So there has to be some critical speed, uh, speed which is safe enough to make this turn. So <coughs> again, this is not a diagram, a picture. It's kind of helpful to draw two pictures, the top view and the side view. From a top, from a top, this is what we see. A car, that's a photograph, a snapshot. A car which has instantaneous velocity, well, tangent to trajectory, that's the center of that circle. Acceleration supposed to point toward the center of a circle. Theoretically, there are other forces but we cannot see, for example, force of gravity or normal force in this picture. Well, also there is a different frictional force. Friction is a tricky force. There has to be frictional force between wheels and ground which propels the car. Yeah, but also there has to be frictional force which responsible for the existence of centripetal acceleration. If we look from a side, we should see normal force, we should see force of gravity, we should see that frictional force which creates centripetal acceleration. And uh, no matter how we look at it, the The only axis which matters is the horizontal axis. Acceleration is parallel or anti-parallel to this axis, and uh, that force which is responsible for the existence of that acceleration also parallel. And if we apply the Newton's second law relative to this axis, we have to write that friction should be equal to ma. Now. As we remember, force of static friction may have any value from technically zero to the maximum. So when we start moving faster and faster yeah, to prevent from skidding away, the force of static friction adjusts accordingly, but it, ca it cannot go above its possible maximum. So the critical speed, critical regime is reached when the force of friction reaches maximum possible value, maximum, how do we call it? Or how do we calculate it? It should be equal to coefficient of static friction times normal force. And on the other hand, that should be equal to mass times speed squared over radius of that turn. How do we calculate the normal force? Well, if we look at the diagram, 
everything happening horizontally on a horizontal surface, normal force and force of gravity have the same magnitude. So the coefficient times mg should be equal to m times v squared over r. And uh, as we saw it many times before, mass getting canceled. So if you want to calculate that critical speed, all we have to do is take a square root of coefficient times the radius times g. Coefficient times the uh, radius times g. 0 0.9 times 10, 9, 900 square root 30. 30 meters per second. That's close to 70 miles per hour or something like that because 72 miles per hour is 30, not 32 meters per second. Well, something like that, 70 something miles per hour. Of course, if the road is slippery, coefficient is lower. In that case, your critical speed will be lower. And if you go above that critical speed, you start skidding away, sliding off a road. Any questions? Well, so the last example probably is traveling on a banked inclined track like this. So again, nothing is so special about it. We just have to apply straightforwardly the Newton's second law Someone stole my vector. So we know that normal force is always perpendicular to a surface, which means when the car travels like this on a banked surface, normal force has to be perpendicular to that surface. That's the only uh, important fact to keep in mind. So we have to draw a diagram with the normal force perpendicular to the surface and apply the Newton's second law. That's it. So. <coughs> Let's do it. Well, first, on this picture, I just want to draw the normal force. That's how it should point. It should be perpendicular to the track. Now, the actual diagram should show all forces and the acceleration. So again, it's instructive to draw two views, the top view and the side view. Well, Top, top view is easy. We just see a car and uh, we can, of course, draw acceleration because it points toward the center, but it is practically impossible to draw the normal force which is supposed to point like this. So how would we see it? That's why we just draw a side view. We cannot see the whole circle we can see only the radius. And the car is traveling, well, horizontally like this. We have to imagine it. This is a photograph, a snapshot of a situation when the car is right here, right now. The normal force has to point perpendicularly to the surface. Normal. Gravity always points down, acceleration points toward the center. Now, what law do I have to write? What is the name of the law I have to write right now? Thank you. Newton's second law, which says the net force should be equal to the product of mass and acceleration. Nothing new. Now again, we have to add vectors. We can do it again using component method or a tail to a head rule. And I prefer the latter 
That's the normal force. That's the force of gravity. That's supposed to be equal to mass times acceleration. Normal gravity, MA. So now we have to draw a triangle. Normal gravity. That gravity would have been too short, right? Why? Because the acceleration has to be horizontal. So I have to keep it drawing until I reach the point which is at the same level at the initial point of uh, uh, the normal force. And now I can draw the third arrow normal gravity m a. Now, uh, angles. This is the angle we know. That's theta, 31 degrees. Mm. Now we have to figure out which of these two angles is theta, is 31 degrees. So that's normal, uh, that's force of gravity, that's normal force. And this, this is 90. So if I extend the normal force, this is theta. That should be 90 minus theta. This should be theta. So this angle between the vertical direction and normal force is theta. In my triangle, theta is here. Done. All we have to do now is just write a couple of geometrical equations. For example, M A. You see, I drop this the little arrow. Now I'm using magnitudes. M A over M G is equal to tangent of this angle. Or M G over normal force is equal to cosine of that angle, which brings us to the expression for the normal force mg over cosine of that angle. It's very important to remember that the expression for the normal force acting on a car making a circular motion on a bank track is not the same as the expression for the normal force of that car on the inclined plane. People make that mistake. This is how we used to write the normal force for a car or anything sliding down a ramp. But sliding down and making a turn to different physical processes. And that's why they require different expressions for the normal force. Well, now you know everything about circular motion. If we solve, if we solve this equation, we can calculate the speed and done. Thank you very much. Have a nice weekend. Yes. First of all, I didn't calculate theta. Not calculate, but how do I you know found which it. one is, yeah, how to find it? I used geometrical reasoning. Mm -hmm. So I know this angle, and this triangle is the right triangle. 